there are some people who change the way we eat. And Marcella Hazan and her cookbooks did that in the early 70s by using uh, what would be found in an Italian person's kitchen. Uh, it's not the spaghettis and meatballs and pizza that Americans were used to. And over the past week, I've gotten numerous emails from people telling me how excited they were that she was coming to Google because they've used her cookbooks for years and they love everything in them. Uh, her new book, Amacor, Marcella Remembers, is a memoir of her experience and how she came to be the great chef that she is. Uh, she will be interviewed by our CIO, uh, Benjamin Freed. And without further ado, Benjamin, Marcella, and her husband, Victor. I'd say husband and collaborator and partner, Victor. Yeah. Um, I think I should preface this by saying that I'm a tremendous fan. As I, I told Marcella and Victor earlier, I've taken their class. And I think that uh, Marcella's voice in her cookbook is what I think of when I think of cooking. And her, the food that is in her cookbooks is what I think of when I think of what my family eats and, and what, we, what we enjoy most eating. So, so with that as a preface for, for, for the, these questions, I, I wanted to start off by, by asking what brought you to writing a memoir that six amazing cookbooks. I never thought of how to do it, and I, and I never thought of that I was going to do it. I was asked. You know, the publisher of the company that did the book uh, was uh, my student. Uh, he took a course in Venice. He took a course uh, like you at the French Culinary Institute and became a very good friend, and so many times on conversation, I was telling him some story of my life, especially the one that they were just a little funny. And um, at one point, uh, what was around two years, Victor? Mm -hmm. yeah. Two years ago, he, he came to Lombard and said, Marcella, I have a wonderful idea. Why don't you write your memoir? I said, are you joking? I don't want to write any more book. So, no, no, but this would not be so difficult, like a cookbook, because you don't have to test the recipe. You don't have to measure the ingredient that I know you don't like to do it. <laughs> and um, so there will be, you don't have to look for recipe. It's just uh, remember what was your life uh, and uh, all the stories that you told us. But he's a very convincing person, you know. So I said, all right, I will do it. And so I started uh, writing. And it was very strange because uh, the memory, they don't have a chronological way to come, you know. One pop here and after it's just a word or a face of a person that you remember that uh, remember also another thing that happened many years after or many years before. And you try to, to, to put it together in some logical way. And also, I never realized that, at least to me it happened this, I don't know if the other person does the same reaction, that uh, if you write your memory and uh, you give again, you know, those, uh, those moments that you are writing, and some, they were sad, and I got very sad when I was writing, you know, look at what happened to me. Sometimes when they are funny, I found myself that I was laughing. Victor was coming and said, what are you laughing about? I'm laughing. What I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. Because they take a volume, a shape, much more. And... Uh, and so it was a uh, all different kind of uh, emotion that I never expected. And um, but anyway, I did it. I hope the other people enjoy it. So I, I was fascinated to read about the the collaboration between the two of you on these books. I think I read a little bit of it in the press. Um, so how did, did that collaboration evolve over time? Can you tell people how it works? I mean, I had before I knew the way you well, two worked. Well, you know, I'm very good at that. When I don't want to learn something, I succeed. <laughs> and that was writing English. For me, English is a very strange language. And uh, the spelling had too many 
not rule. And um, so I decided that was impossible. So when the first time they asked me to write the cookbook, it was that was a cookbook, and they said, uh, well, would you like to write one? And I said, no. They said, why? Well, because I don't write in English. And Vitor said, well, if you want, I will translate. I said, well, all right. But I didn't know anything about writing a book, especially a cookbook, believe me. So much I knew little that uh, when I went there to sign the contract, and the publisher asked me, Marcella, how much time do you think you need? I said, I don't know, two months? <laughs> he looked at me and they said, but let's make it 10 at least. <laughs> but, but did you know, I did it in 10 months, that book, because there were all recipes, all dishes that I would keep cooking at home, so I didn't have to look for recipe, just to wait. And so we did it. The other book was not the same story. Uh. I never wrote a book or one other book in less than five years, maybe because I was teaching also. Uh. I don't know, but no. it was different. Has the process that you and Victor used to write the books changed over time after this is your, your seventh book? Is that, uh, is that right? No. Um, sometimes went very smooth, sometimes didn't come so smooth because... Uh, uh, Vitor is very organized, is very particular, and impulsive, and um, I'm not. And uh, so I wrote the recipe, gave it to him to translate. And after he was coming to me and I said, Oh, Marcella, all the string beans that I eat in this house, they don't have both hands. I said, Of course, I took it out. But you didn't say, okay, give me back the recipe. <laughs> back. And in the meantime, maybe I was testing a recipe new in the kitchen, and I was waiting, which is for me is like to be in prison, you know. I don't like to wait. And it um, was coming after 30 seconds. You said, boil the stream beans. And how much water? Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, let's put it this back where I was. Did I measure the olive oil or I didn't measure the olive oil? What, how much was it? Okay, start again, come back. You cover the pot or you don't cover the pot? And go on, you know, and sometimes I was losing my patient and start screaming, that is enough, Victor. But uh, you know what? I found out after that he was right. Because if the person said that my recipe worked, it's because he doesn't know how to cook. He wanted to know everything. You know. And that one. In this book, was different. Because uh, when I start writing about when I was born and so on, uh, that few years of my life, naturally, they were what my parents or grandparents had told me, you know. And after I met Victor, all the period during the war when I was studying and uh, teaching, not cooking. Mm. And other thing, you know, Victor was not there. So when I gave him what I wrote, he could not say, no, it's not like this and that, you know. Okay. But after 53 years of marriage, he was always there. Yeah. And so we had discussion. With another way, you know, the Marcella was not true, was not Pamela in the restaurant. It was Marta that it happened in this story. Or it was not this restaurant, was the other restaurant. Because memory, they're never just exactly the same for the two persons. So we had the other discussion. And I have to say, which I don't like to say it, but most of the time he was right. <laughs> anyway, so we did that. So uh, about, I was amazed in reading the book at the number of places you've lived for such extended periods of time, growing up in, I'm sure I'll murder the pronunciation, Chesanatico. Uh, the, spent, the time you spent in the war on Lake Garda. Mm. Uh, Milan, Rome, Venice. 
Bologna, when Victor lived What's outside of Florida. What's that about Florida? I was, I was getting to that. New York. Oh, okay. Florida. <laughs> um, and, and one question I had is, are, are there, after having lived in so many places, are there tastes that, or flavors that mean home to you? And do they all come from your childhood or come from these different places where you've lived? Are there tastes that have strong associations in your mind with these periods well, of time? Uh, you are talking about places in Italy because I'm writing about Italian food only. Okay, yes. How about New York as but, well or America? Well, uh, let me tell you, I never cook in my life until I married. No, I never boil water if it was not in the beaker in the laboratory. So. And my first dishes, they were cooked in New York, which it was uh, incredibly hot because uh, I didn't have, I didn't know one word of English, so I could not ask anything to anyone. And um, the only person that uh, I could talk was Victor, that's all. But Victor was not there all day. And when he was coming home, he was expecting to have dinner, <laughs> especially because food for Victor was very important. Do you know that when he was courting me, he was always talking about food? <laughs> <laughs> he was telling me about what he ate and for lunch and after what he's expecting to eat it for dinner. And I thought it was not very romantic. <laughs> But I found out that it was very important for him. So when I married, that I came to New York, and I didn't know English, I'd never cooked. And I saw the first supermarket. Everything was dead there. Yeah. Everything was wrapped in a coffin. <laughs> I never said it food, put it that way, but I have to cope with those things. But you know, I had, I didn't know that I had memory some part of my brain, and you know, the, 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 the smell of the food that I ate at home, the look of the food, and most important, the taste of the food. And maybe I had absorbed like osmosis, you know. And uh, so uh, at one point, when I was looking for they came out. They had. Yes. And then what? And he helped me a lot. Yeah. You know why? Because when I cook something, they brought at the table, and we eat it, and it came good. He was jumping from the table, come to kiss me. They said, how wonderful I am. <laughs> so I wanted to do more and more, and so I got interested in food that I didn't know that I, I was never interested before. So I start learning cooking with the ingredient that I found in America, Italian food. After when we moved to Italy, and we moved so much, and I was already very much interested in food, but personally, not uh, professionally, I never thought it to be. Um, when we were in Milan, I tried to see the cooking of that region, the product of that region, and so on, when we were in Rome, the same thing, and so on. And when we travel, always I want to try to go in the kitchen of someone. Well, you know, I wanted to expand on that because uh, addressing your question is which, uh, having moved so much, uh, the, uh, the food that we prepared and we discovered which was the one that corresponded to the taste of home. But it was all, always the taste of home because wherever we were, the cooking that we responded to was not chef's cooking. It was not professional cooking. It was always the cooking of somebody's home. And I think that is what distinguishes Marcella's uh, work. It is not chef-inspired. and It's not chef related is the cooking that it is family cooking which we think of as the ultimate step in the ladder of cooking i know that things are reversed uh, these days and newspapers are always talking about 
about chefs, but I think that's a, an anomaly because uh, what has produced the civilizations that uh, characterize history are families, never restaurants. This is a, a, a fairly recent development. And so that is what we go back to, and that is what we collected. Where and Marcello also had an unusual opportunity uh, in Italy later on, you know, that uh, her last cookbook was published in 2004. And during all of those years, the first was in uh, 1973, during, in the interval, I became involved in writing about wine. I'm and and I knew perhaps you were going to get to that. But as I was writing about wine, I researched wine in Italy, traveling to every Italian region and to every significant producer of wine. Marcella was with me. And so wherever you go, wherever there's someone who produces wine, there's someone in a kitchen there producing family cooking. And that gave Marcella an extraordinary opportunity to get into family kitchens throughout the entire Italian peninsula. You were going to the cellar, I was going to the kitchen. <laughs> you know, of the wife of of uh, the director of the, the, what, the owner of the factory. And I was always in the kitchen to say, well, tell you cooking and so on. You, you both beautifully segued into the next questions I wanted to ask. For, for Victor, um, 1982, you came out with Italian wine, which yeah. is uh, fantastic. Have you thought about writing another book since then? I mean, uh, Well, I was, as a matter of fact, I was under contract uh, with uh, Paris Strauss Giroux to, uh, to produce a second book of Italian wine. And I worked on it fairly di diligently for a few years. And I had a very patient editor, and he kept uh, pushing the delivery date and, you know, the forward, and it didn't matter, but he said, just as long as you produce a good book. And I tried very hard. And again, I traveled all over the country. But what happened between the first book and the project for the second book is that Italian, Italian wine changed for many people for the better. And I'm not saying it's either for the better or the worse, but it, it was no longer wine that I could recognize uh, uh, as Italian. But uh, Italian wine was, for me, was a product of uh, one or several of a thousand or more grape varieties that were native to Italian territories that over the centuries had developed in response to the character of the soil and the climates of those territories and produced very distinctive tastes. Those were Italian wines. As I started researching my second book, I found that no matter where I went, there was somebody doing something with Cabernet and Merlot or with Syrah or with Pinot Noir, or with combinations of things, putting them in French barrels so they would have the same oaky flavor that wine produced in California or in Australia or in Chile might have. And I'm not saying that the result was bad because they're all, that technically the wine perhaps was even improved. It no longer had an Italian character, and so I, I reluctantly wrote my very nice editor and says, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I can complete this book. And even more reluctantly, I had to return the advance. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of, the, uh, of my second wine book. So, um, so Marcello, you, let's, I'm paused with sadness for a moment at the thought of that. But, but uh, to turning to something you mentioned, Marcella, you have Two doctorates in science, in natural science and zoology, is that my remember? Yes, the one is geology. Geology. Geology, thank you. Geology and paleontology. And the other is biology. When I came to America, um, I, after a little while, because either I was working, because I was teaching also in Italy before meeting that people. And uh, I had to do something, you know, and uh, so I started looking for a job. I didn't look to teach because my English was terrible 
but actually it was very, very little. And uh, but um, it was almost impossible because I had an interview, I remember, with Elena Rubenstein, and uh, she said, I didn't understand one word what she was saying. <laughs> so I had to leave. I had another interview with another hospital to do some work in the laboratory there, and it was the same thing. So I decided if I could catch one sentence that was asking me if I wanted to work there, I was going to say yes. So at last, I got an interview. I didn't understand one word what he said, but I understood that he asked me if I wanted to work there, and I said yes. But I didn't know at all what I was going to do. So much of that I went home and I said to it, I got a job, but I think tomorrow they're going to buy it. <laughs> but uh, I learned and I worked there. Why I said that now? What was the question? <laughs> well, I was just, so I, I guess my question was really, you have these, uh, these degrees in science and oh. you had talked about how you explored Italy and the cuisine and wine of Italy. And I was wondering if your training as a scientist, your training as well, a field scientist had been a help in, in that. It helped me because doing research in New York in the laboratory, I was doing research in uh, pyuria, you know, the gum disease. I was always in the mouth, as you see. <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, doing research, doesn't matter which field is the same thing, doing research for cooking on the laboratory. And uh, that it helped me. It helped me a little for myself. In teaching or writing, I tried not to bring out of those things, you know. I did only when um, help uh, I had a student uh, to understand what I was talking about. Because I remember that in Venice, I, I was taking the student to the market and see also some store of ingredient. And I'd stop in front of a, a window of a butcher. And I was telling, you know, that they have a half of an the animal there hanging. And I was look, telling them about the idea of you have this. Uh, uh, you are eating, the, when you eat this, the muscle comes from here. And I look at the faces of the students. They were black faces. That, uh, you, you don't know that you are eating muscle, but you are think, thinking you are eating bone, skin, <laughs> fat. You are eating the muscle. No, they didn't have any idea about that. You know, and I was very surprised. So for that reason, I could explain them and try to tell them there were the fibers, like an elastic. They reacting with the heat in that way. It helped. It helped them, and it helped me to make them understand why they cook it in that way, why they cut it in that way. But just if it was possible to explain more something. If not, I left it aside. So speaking of the marketing in Italy, I think some of the most, some of the most beautiful parts of the book are the descriptions of the produce, of the butchers, of the, the fish in Italy. And my... Uh, my question was, are there parts of America or American produce that, were, that you've ever found to, to mirror or equal the quality of what you describe in Italy? Because the descriptions of, of Campo di Fiori and of the market in Milan when you lived there, are, I thought, were these incomparable descriptions of natural, sensual beauty. And you didn't mention the market in Venice. No. Yeah. And well, I, let me tell yeah. you one thing about the market in Venice, and that you understand why it's not really possible that it happened here. In the market, you, you, could, you could see either in the fish part or the vegetable part, the same thing, the same artichokes or the same soul. And one has a price and the other has a, a higher price. The one who has the higher price is written a word that is nostrani, that means local. They cost much more. The vegetable, they arrive from an island just a few miles from the, where is the market. 
And so they, they were picked up two hours before. The fish was caught the, the night before in the lagoon. And if you see the market, you see that, that the salt does still this, do you know, because we wanted to, to leave. We don't think about the, the, the little crab or think that they walk around. And one of the stories of the vendor is try to catch it and put it back yeah. there because they don't want to lose it. And the people is willing to pay more because they were really fresh. The, the fish that cost less in Italy, the cheaper, is a salmon. Because I arrived from outside of Italy, I arrived the, the same day or the next day, but not in two hours, three hours. In America, do you think it's very open? Very often happened this. I mean, there are farmers markets, right? Sometimes. Yes, there are farmers market. Until and I, I have one in Florida, and I went there until I got very disillusioned because I saw a big trunk arrive there with cases of products from California. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "It's farmers, yes, up to a certain point." So it's different that you know that you don't have this uh, freshness. Yeah, you have good product. You can cook Italian food. You do it, you told me. So I try. you know that you do it. But um, when I wrote the book, I had to try to juggle a little to have the same taste of Italy because the texture is different. The, the taste is different a little, and I had uh, to do something, put a little more of this or less of this to get near the taste. Are, are there routinely dependable supermarket ingredients that, that are, uh, you know, or things one should avoid in particular? Well, you know, I don't know what to tell you because uh, sometimes the same chain of supermarket we have it. Supermarket in Florida that is called public. Okay. The one that is in Lombard Key that uh, is more near where I live, because I live in Lombard Key, has much better vegetable usually than the one that is in Sarasota, four miles only far away, and who has a better meat. So, you know, if you have time, and you drive, which I don't, which is my problem there, uh, you have to cope with what you find. We have also all food, which I get, um, I don't like, because they, they put uh, this vegetable so nice, they don't look real anymore. They look like a painting, you know? And they keep, uh, Spreading water, 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 but the water can make them rotten. And I, I don't know. Yeah, you know, so often we've taken vegetables home that look beautiful, and we've had to we've had to throw them out because they they had have to dry long it past their prime the, in the refrigerator. You know, it's it's, it's, it's yeah. another way. It's a commercial, and I, they look very fresh. But they are not anymore very fresh at all. And no taste. Well, you know, the, uh, the interesting thing is, is uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this neologism that is uh, current now, locavores. Have, yeah. You, yeah. have you heard of locavores? Locavores yeah. are those who eat things only that are produced locally. And uh, it's being presented as a revolutionary uh, approach to buying food. But... The market in Venice, Venetians have been doing this. They, that market is a thousand years old. They've been doing this for hundreds of years. And as Marcella said, the, everything that is locally produced has a little label that says Nostrano, or depending on the gender, Nostrana or, uh, or Nostrani. And that always has a premium in price. Uh, and it is desirable for two reasons. One, because it's local. It's fresher, but also because it's local, it tastes of home. 
And the taste of home is an extremely important concept to Italian. That, you know, relates also to my abandoning my wine project. You know, I was coming across lots of perfectly produced wines that tasted of no particular place. And the taste of a place, I don't know if you can uh, ever come up with this in uh, in America. It's very, it's very difficult, very difficult to do. It's... Uh, uh, transportation is too efficient. It's too large a country. And the sense that something produced, uh, say, in New Jersey has a different flavor than something produced in Alabama still, still is difficult for it to take root, I think. Do you know that the basil here has always a slight <coughs> mint flavor? Yeah. You've got to use it. Maybe you don't catch it anymore. So I was very mad about, and I said, well, now I'm doing one thing. So I was going to Italy, and uh, there a friend of mine was there having a beautiful plant of basil, and was going to seed. So I said, hmm, wait for the seed. Please give me the seed, and I wanted to plant it in my apartment in New York, naturally. What I found, that the soil was American soil, no? Mm. And I planted. But the same plant in Italy didn't have any mint taste. Here, got mint taste. And it was the same seed. It was the soil was different. And uh, so I could not do anything. Yeah, those are the tastes, the tastes of home. So um, speaking, what do you eat when you come to New York out, out of curiosity? Where do you eat? What do you eat? Chinese, Japanese food. <laughs> because, uh, two reasons. First, because I like it very much. And second, because uh, I don't have it in Florida. And also, I have a special feeling for Chinese food because if, we, if I never took a Chinese cooking lesson in my life, I wouldn't. Really, I was not going here to be talk about food, and you could have books of mine. So this is a great My story career, yes, about Madame Chu, right? In that class, um, the teacher went uh, to uh, back to China, and uh, some of the students there they had asked me, uh, Marcella, what do you cook at home? Naturally, I answered normal food. And they said, what is normal food? Italian food, okay. So they asked me to teach, which I thought that they were crazy, because I never thought I was teaching food, me, no. But, uh, you know, I had stopped to work in the laboratory for other reasons. And Vito said, well, you like to teach, you like to cook, why don't you do something? So you start complaining that you don't know what to do. Okay, so I start. And I talked to them, I started uh, giving lessons once a week in October, and we reach uh, June, always with the same, those six lady. And in June, I said, goodbye, I'm going to Italy for vacation and see my band. Better asked me if I wanted to continue. And I said, yes, I enjoy it. I, I like it very much to do it. But who is coming? No one knew. So he wrote a letter to the... New York Times, because they had a, a list of a cooking school. But we were too late. The list was already out. Now, you know that if you know another language, the telephone is a monster. No? Very difficult to understand. So one day I got a call from someone. I understood that was from New York Times that he wanted to come to talk about the cooking lesson a Wednesday. I said, all right, at what time? 12.30. I said, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I said, at 12.30, we have lunch. I said, what about Thursday? Good. What time? 12.30. <laughs> but we always eat lunch at 12.30, <laughs> I said. If you really wanted to come at 12.30, come for lunch. It was a little quiet and that, I said. Really, your husband came home for lunch, of course. Okay, I accept. 
Peter came home, and what happened today? He said, someone, and I told him. He said, you didn't catch the name. You know that name, especially in English, I never catch it. And I said, uh, you don't have any idea? I said, well, yes, it was something like crack, crack, I don't know. Is said, crack, claybone? I think so. You don't know who is? No. But you read his column, you have his book, because I never look at the name, you know, because anyway, I don't remember. Anyway, he came. He wrote a beautiful article. He was enjoying the meal, and the school was launching again. I never had a problem to find students after. So that is why I like also Chinese food. Do you getting ever... answers to questions you haven't asked? Uh, but they're better. The answers are better than the questions. So <laughs> let's, let's go. You. Do you ever cook the Chinese food that you learned from Madame Chu? At that time, yes. Now it's years that I don't cook it anymore. I don't think I'm able anymore to do it. Um. So. I guess a, a question I, I, I had was, uh, what is bad Italian cooking? What is bad Italian uh, Italian food? You kind of you speak about this kind of indirectly in the book a little bit about. Uh, Oof, a difficult question, but I don't know. It's uh, because it's not Italian. <laughs> uh, supposed to be Italian, but it's not. I don't know. They do no, things that, you know, no, one no, of no, the, but I think that um, one thing about Italian cooking is garlic. I use a lot of garlic, but you never, never come in the house and smell garlic, and also I'm cooking that moment. They burn the garlic, and they cook it too much, it became acid. They overcook uh, the, the tomato if they have fresh tomato. Or also sometimes with very good canned tomato, if you cook it too long, you will ruin the tomato. And, um, and after, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, also the dishes that, that, that here they're Italian, but you never find in Italy. Uh, manicotti is a, is an American dish. Really? You don't find manicotti all over Italy. You don't find a can of uh, uh, tomato with basil leaf in Italy. No one has it. You don't have an espresso with a lemon peel, by sure, and so on. Also, you know that the... The immigrant, which they have a problem about uh, buying food, feed themselves. And they came here, and luckily they could make a living. And now, you know, they, the portion has to be big, manja, manja, always. You know. I guess you eat, but uh, the, the pasta is over sauce because the sauce was the most expensive part of the dish. So they, they make dishes which you eat sauce with pasta. It's, you are not eating pasta with sauce, which is different. And after, they became extreme sometime. Do you know that before the pasta was um, overcooked, was mushy, now they learned the word al dente, Yes, but al dente and, and raw, they are two different things. <laughs> and now you have the pasta that if you bite, you look at the center, is not cooked yet, white, right? yeah. you know. And, um, and, and many other things that... Um, I think that it improved a lot from when I start, especially because... Now you have a much better ingredient, much variety. You know that I wrote, when I wrote the first book, it was only one olive oil in America. And um, it was not extra virgin and was terrible. Wow. But if they sell it in a big, uh, how you yeah. call it, a can, yes, you know? Yeah. Four liter was Like a gasoline terrible. can. Yeah. Right. 
And, but it was the only one that you could find. And I remember the name Madre Sicilia. I hope that it is not around. No, I haven't seen it anymore. Eh? I haven't seen it anymore. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, I but, think, uh, to put it succinctly, bad Italian food is too much food on the plate. Oh, yes. Uh, that, that, that is and that. too many things on the plate. In Italy, for example, if we... Uh, we never had served pasta alongside something else. It's never a dish of something with a, a, a side order of pasta. That's not that's not it. And the other thing is, vegetables are so highly regarded. They're the they're the diamonds of the kitchen. If you uh, if you go to a restaurant and you order something, you order a piece of fish or you order a meat dish. And that is exactly what you get then. You get your fish, you get your meat, and then if you want a vegetable, you order that vegetable. That comes in, in a little separate uh, dish and it's uh, uh, prepared with an extraordinary amount of care, aside from the fact that the original ingredient is, is wonderful. Here, you, uh, if you go to an Italian restaurant and you order, I don't know what... Uh, uh, say eggplant parmigiana, there may be eggplant parmigiana, but there are five or six different things in that plate, and it's uh, they don't belong was, together. It's very awkward. They don't belong together. Sometimes they fight, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes that, uh, and sometimes they're just barely boiled. That they were just in the hot water coming out because now. Everything is supposed to be al dente, and also the vegetable, they are not cooked. And so that is, that is the difference. Yesterday I asked for a piece of chicken, and they said, would you like some um, fried uh, potatoes? I said, okay. And I thought to have a dish of fried potatoes. Instead, I had a piece of chicken. And after I had a mountain that I had, to try because when they put it down, they fall out because it was a mountain of fried potatoes. And uh, those fried potatoes, the one that they were far from the chicken, they were still crispy. The one that they were near the crispy, they soaked the sauce and they were soggy. Oop, very bad. <laughs> anyway, we can cope. <laughs> um. I guess on, on a related theme, in your later cookbooks, did the, the, I guess, the changing attitudes towards health change how you constructed recipes? Um, you know, as Americans uh, became uh, concerned about fat and about eating too much meat and uh, in their diets, did American dietary concerns have a, an effect on the recipes that you put in your later cookbooks? as these health concerns kind of changed between 1973 and Well, uh, uh, let me tell you one thing. Uh, that was a reason different because uh, uh, when I wrote the first book or the second book, uh, um, the ingredients, uh, they were not, they were less good than now, let's say. And I had uh, to cope with uh, seasoning. You know, to put more seasoning to bring out the flavor because they didn't have flavor. But after um, change, now in the supermarket you find artichokes, you find fennel. At, um, at my time of the beginning, I had to go to Ninth Avenue. But uh, so I, I could cut it down, but not really for health because I didn't need it. Mm-hmm. And um, because our food is naturally uh, balanced, it's naturally healthy. We have a small portion to begin with, and uh, they're not overly seasoned. Right. And this focus mm-hmm. on the vegetables as well yeah. is up. Yes. Well, I, think, you know, I think what has happened is, uh, is the, the, in reverse order, instead of our having to adapt our cooking to new fashions, uh, 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 influenced by considerations of, of health, those who were influenced by considerations of health discovered our cooking was the one to follow because it was healthy to begin with. 
So if you if you are in Italy, uh, depending which part of Italy, north, south, or center, if you see an obese person, very often is an American. <laughs> then, no, I, I'm not laughing. Don't laugh. It's not really it's true. You find maybe how I can say choppy person, you know, but not obese, and. Uh, because we have, first of all, you know, we don't have breakfast much. We have also me. I have just this morning double espresso. That's all. You have lunch for first meal, and still we have it, which is not easy in America, because doctor give an appointment at twelve o'clock, or the plumber come at home to do something at twelve o'clock. I don't know why we are at the table at that time, and um, you know, but you have a meal. That is a small portion. It's a small portion of pasta, a small portion of meat, but always is some vegetable. Very rarely we eat a dessert, cake. We eat a lot of fruit. Marinated like they are, uh, cooked or not, what? Evening we eat very little. A cooked vegetable, a piece of cheese, or a prosciutto with some lemon melon, but very little. So how you can gain weight? Have you have you traveled in Italy, Ben? I have, I have. And have you uh, have you not no, noticed that men uh, have have flat tummies and exactly. women have long waistlines? Uh, <laughs> no, I did. I was amazed that they could maintain that given the quality of the food I ate. It was natural to want to eat a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they, they also. They, it happened to me, too, if you eat something that you really don't like very much, you keep eating because you, you try to see if it changes a little or the other thing. But if you eat something that is satisfied, you're satisfied with less. So I think, did we have questions from the, I think we, we've denied the audience the opportunity to ask questions so far. Do we have questions from the local audience or the remote audience to, to work on? How it works. Uh, thank you both so much for coming. It's been great. Uh, my question is actually for Victor. Um, I'm curious if you have a particular dish that Marcella makes that you most look forward to or find yourself craving and most enjoy eating. Let's say, you know, that's a question that comes up all, all the time. I'm not very original. No, no. <laughs> it, 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 it seems to preoccupy everyone. And uh, it, we can't answer it uh, directly because there are so many dishes. But I can answer a different question. If you could rephrase that and say, is there a category of dishes that you look forward to? I could answer instantly, say pasta. I would find it very difficult to face the rest of my life if I couldn't have pasta. Uh, next to pasta come vegetables. We have an enormous affection for vegetables also because, you know, we have such wonderful vegetables in, uh, in Italy. I don't know why it is so difficult in this country to find a good green bean or a good zucchini. They, uh, they seem to, be, to have been over-irrigated. They're, uh, they're diluted in flavor. So pasta is our number one category. We can't do without that. Next to that is vegetables. Next to that perhaps would be fish. Uh, the very end would be meat. Dessert, never. I never look, except for chocolate, I would say chocolate is the indispensable uh, element, except for chocolate. There, there is no, I never have a feeling that I want a dessert at the end of a, of a meal. We do have desserts we have nice pasta in Italy, but that's something we eat when when we stroll in the afternoon and and we have a little bit of spare time. This goes with the uh, ca uh, cafe civilization that Italy is so good at. You sit somewhere and you see your friends passing by, and you have a little a little something. But never at home. I don't know anyone at home who has. Just we have fruit, but we don't we don't think. For example, in this in this country, I found uh, I I always ask people: Is your mother was your mother a very good cook, or your father a very good cook? 
And they were saying, oh, yes, my mother was a wonderful cook. Every day we had a, a fresh pie. You know? And good cooking, I, I've discovered, for Americans often means somebody at home who makes wonderful dessert. And I think there are very few Italian cooks who know how to make dessert. I'm sorry, that's a long-winded answer to a, a very simple question. Are there questions, remote questions on the dory? It's, uh, it sounds like Italy is pretty great, and I'm wondering why <laughs> you guys would um, stick around and stay maybe in Florida and when you could be enjoying so much of the wonderful bounty of food and, 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 and markets in Italy. Um, it makes me want to move there. <laughs> it's a good question. But uh, you know, we, we were always resident of New York, also when we lived in Italy. And uh, in it, the last 20 years that we lived in Italy was in Venice. And Venice is uh, on the it doesn't exist another city like Venice. It doesn't exist a city without car. You cannot have a car. <laughs> and um, better you have to walk and you have to climb uh, uh, bridges. And you don't realize how many steps a day you do up and down, up and down those bridges. And when you became old, like, you know how old I am? I'm 84 and a half. I put also the half. At one point, uh, your leg, uh, they don't work very much. And uh, you need uh, uh, medical assistance, uh, which was uh, almost impossible for us to, be, to have it because we were not resident and also because didn't exist in Venice. So we thought that to come back uh, to America where the life, that part was much easier. That is the answer. We're big fans of your uh, cookbooks at home. And my wife said, if I had the opportunity to ask you, what is your favorite olive oil? <laughs> well, first of all, let me tell you something that I found not many person knows. When you buy an olive oil, read the label. Because if it say packed in Italy, doesn't mean that the olive come from Italy. I have a friend that get the olive from, and this also for a tomato, for any product. Like tomato, they come many that they are packed in Italy. They come from Argentina, the San Marzano type, and from Greece there also, and Turkey. So, but if you read produced and packed in Italy, that they are Italian, okay? Now, this is generally, now, Many olive oil in Italy, they are good, depending about uh, which one you prefer. I like very much uh, the olive oil that comes from Puglia, the, the, what's it called, the taco? The heel. The heel of the shoe, the, the boot, or from uh, Lake of Garda. The one from Liguria is very light, go very well with fish. I'm not very fond of the Tuscan olive oil because it, it um, peppery. pepper in my throat. It's too spicy, too strong. And sometimes I don't want that strong flavor in my dish. So every region has a good olive oil. And usually it goes with their own cooking. I found lately that maybe the one from Puglia uh, managed more cooking than other olive oil. 
fat uh, taste. And the good the taste to olive oil is just a, a hot boiled potato with a little salt to taste. If you don't, if you are in the store, just to have a cracker or something and the taste that if they allowed you to taste it. But you know, if you have a lot of friends, one way to do that is to uh, to buy half bottle of different kinds of olive oil, uh, Apulian, Sicilian. Tuscan, if you want to try Tuscan, you are not very likely to find oil from Lake of Garda, which happens to be one of our favorites. Anyway, you have these little samples and have a boiled potato, and you must compare them at that moment together with, I say a lot of friends, because that way you can have uh, you know more than two bottles of oil, or you can just uh, fill a table oil. And then... By comparing, you will find the kind of olive oil that you respond to. Your friends may like something different. It's really very, very subjective. Uh, in our case, as Marcella said, we, uh, we're not as fond of Tuscan olive oil as, uh, as some others because we find it uh, of too strong an impact on, uh, on the palate. And uh, we don't use Ligurian olive oil as often as some other people do, because it's uh, too thin, too too light, too delicate. It's very wonderful on uh, on uh, on seafood, but not for cooking vegetables or in uh, in other preparations. But this is something that's subjective, and you have to find what you respond to more more comfortably. Last last question. Uh, first, I just wanted to say that I love your cookbooks. Thank you. Uh, but some of my favorite recipes from them uh, sometimes take a lot of time. Uh, and I'm wondering if you, uh, what's your opinion, if it's possible to do good cooking, uh, for cooking to be as good if, uh, if it's prepared in a shorter amount of time? Of course. My goodness. The, in Italy, uh, we cook for lunch and we cook for dinner. And uh, many families, they both work. How they could do it, it was not possible. Because there, there are many. You, look, you have a pasta sauce that you have to have a pot. You have a pot. Okay, put a piece of butter, peel an onion. Buy a, a good can of tomato. You put the onion, the butter, the tomato, light the fire. Let it cook in the middle time you do other things. In a little while they will finish and you have one uh, sauce that all the Azan family prefer. That is uh, for the first course. You wanted to have a chicken. Okay, buy a chicken and two lemon only. That's all. You did it? You like it? Yeah. And you like it. Yeah. <laughs> I found out that if someone try it, have a faith in me and try it, they keep doing. And then you just put the, the two lemon. After you make it soft and peel with anything, a, a fork or something, put it in the cavity closed. Not perfectly because it would explode, but nice. <laughs> and you put it in the oven and you do other things. And you have one of them and also they're very good also room temperature, leftovers, yeah? This is one, two, three, just in this group. <laughs> so you can do that. You want a vegetable? Uh, yesterday I was tired to, to eat out, and uh, a friend, uh, you remember Susan that helped right, me of in there? Susan, the assistant. Yes. Yeah. She had a house upstairs in New York, and then she brought me tiny little zucchini, and some garlic, and I had bought some olive oil. Okay, I washed the zucchini, I cut it up, I put a three clove of garlic, just peeled because I didn't have a good knife to cut it. And uh, I'm in the hotel. And uh, I cook it, and uh, it took uh, 10 minutes. And it was done. What do you more? Done many, many more, believe me, in the book. It takes not much time, and not many ingredients also. I think we're, speaking of time, I think we're out of time. 
Okay. Thank you, Marcello, Victor, thank you both so much for coming and for well, it wasn't nice. answering these questions. I'm sorry we ran over time. <laughs> <laughs>